React is the uh, second book in the series, uh, which tries to, which is going to, uh, over the course of the series, explain behavioral science to the reading public. Uh, the first one was called Energize, um, and that covered sort of all aspects of motivation, but in, in very little detail. And then this one is uh, focusing on what we've called, uh, what I've sort of termed, and it's not a particularly novel idea, the animal brain, um, as distinct from uh, what I've also termed the human brain. And those of you are familiar with the prime theory of motivation, that will sort of resonate with you. So, to, you know, today we're focusing on emotions, drives, uh, habits, instincts, the sort of stuff that we uh, share with other species as well. Um, and the next book in the series, which is about halfway through writing, is going to be called Reflect, uh, and that's going to look at uh, conscious decision making and planning. And there's lots of cool stuff in there uh, to talk about. The format for the book, for those of you who are not familiar with it or with Energize, it was actually Jamie's idea. It was a bit um, unusual because it's done as a dialogue. Um, and Jamie got the idea from, I think, re what, reading a book by John Cleese. I think it was on depression that uh, he thought really worked well. And I think it does work well for something, for sort of psychology topics for the reading public, because Jamie can take the perspective of the, uh, of the interested reader who can sort of question and get me to elaborate on things. And the way um, we did it was that... Um, Jamie, it, was, it wasn't a hard slog, at least it wasn't for me, um, that we would basically sit down over lunch at our local restaurant, Bistro Laz, which will be familiar to some of you, um, and Jamie would have his recorder on, so we'd talk about various topics, and then Jamie would go away and edit it, and then we would edit it and edit it and edit it and so on, uh, and so we'd take what would otherwise probably be about 350 or 400 pages and condense it down. Um, and uh, we wanted it, we want all of these books to be, you know, really sort of digestible. Um, but it also means that we don't do what a lot of books of this kind do, which is to sort of keep repeating ourselves. Uh, so um, uh, although we do try and use illustrations and things for the points, we don't we don't sort of go bang on and on and on about the same idea. Um, uh, not that all books do that, but uh, many of this sort do. So um, okay, so what? might you learn from React? Uh, well, the title, Harness Your Animal Brain, actually is very apposite because uh, in Energize, uh, we talk about this metaphor that's been in existence for donkey's years, hundreds of years, about the horse and the rider, talking about the human motivational system, where you've got uh, the, ho the horse is kind of, you know, what we're calling the animal brain and the rider is the human brain. But the, and, and there's lots of sort of what they call dual process theories in psychology of one sort or another. So it's a kind of dual process theory, sort of clever bit, stupid bit, or, uh, thinking fast, thinking slow, automatic, reflective, and so on. But the key point that we want to try and get across in these books is that the uh, because the rider is sitting on the horse, the rider has to get the horse to do the work for him. You can't, we don't have, or the clever part of our brain doesn't have direct access to our behavior. It has to work through the animal brain. And that makes a very big difference to how we behave. And it's a really important thing. So these human brain and the animal brain are not acting in parallel with each other. They're, they're acting in series, if you like. So that's a, an, an important part. And that's why we call it a harnessing the animal brain, because you're not battling the animal brain. You're not trying to sort of, you know, <laughs> beat the hell out of it or stop it doing stuff. You're actually harnessing it so that as, as, a, as a brain as a whole, we're, um, uh, we're able to do the things that we set out to do, that we want to do. So when we're talking about emotions, drives, desires, habits and instincts and impulses and feelings and so on, we're not, talk we're not saying that these are bad things, these are good things, but they're things which do need to be harnessed. And the more we know about them, the better we can do it. And that's what this book is about. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Jamie West, the co-author of, uh, of the book, React, Harness Your Animal Brain. Here's the hard copy. Um, it's really wonderful to be with you to finally launch this book. And um, I'm going to talk very briefly about what we were aiming for writing this book. Whether we achieved it, you will tell us and uh, hopefully give you a flavor of what to expect. So um, 
growing up, uh, having a psychologist as a parent, one of the fun things was conversation at dinner. Uh, Dad would talk to us about the Stanford prison experiment or the Milgram experiments where people would deliver fake electric shocks because they were told to. Uh, Amazing stuff, particularly to a nine-year-old. And to this day, uh, you know, we love to discuss all aspects of psychology. So when it came time to write these books, it seemed quite natural to present them uh, as a conversation and which we can now invite you into as well. I do think there's a lot of game-changing stuff in the book, stuff that um, has really helped me, particularly as a writer, but in many other aspects of my life, which uh, we'll get to some of that a bit later, hopefully. Um, But anyway, I'm just keeping it brief. Before I go on, I did want to thank uh, Alia Kashani, who is the editor for the book series, and she did a a wonderful job, um, very sensitively editing the the book. And uh, to Matthew and Daniel, my uh, brothers from Silverback Publishing, who've worked really hard on it as well. Hi, everybody. My name is Keith Humphreys. I'm a professor of psychiatry at Stanford University. And like the authors of the book React, Harness Your Animal Brain, I study human psychology. Um, I'm really impressed with this book, uh, and let me tell you why. Uh, The human brain, I think of as, it's like a monkey riding a horse while trying to explain the actions of a lizard. That's what evolution has bequeathed to us. And that fact that we do have an animal brain and a a more, what we think of as the more human part of our psychology as well, makes being a person and trying to understand yourself and other people fascinating, but also extremely confusing and complicated. And to get through something uh, that is that, has the characteristics, you really need uh, terrific tour guides, and Robert West and Jamie West are absolutely that. Um, This is just a wonderfully engaging book um, and about what what human psychology is, how we make decisions, why we have the feelings that we do. And very nicely, it is not a jargony, academic-y, theoretical book. Uh, It's practical, it's uh, easy to uh, understand, it's got great explanations, and it helps you understand things people want to understand, like why is it hard to stick to a diet or to an exercise regime, or how do our phones uh, affect us uh, with all their beeping and clicking and notifications, and how do, why does advertising have an influence on it? And why do we have unusual experiences, like for example, really wanting to do something, and then when we do it, we find that we don't like it. Um, and they, they walk the reader through all these things with um, very clear and practical examples, also some wit uh, between them and uh, some very, very nice cartoons. I'd, I'd uh, recommend this book for anyone who feels a bit intimidated by neuroscience but would like to understand it. This book is completely welcoming and unpretentious. Uh, and it helps, helps the reader um, understand uh, really complicated things. The other thing I really like this book is the evident warmth between uh, uh, Robert and Jamie. Which, you, know, you, you just want to sit down and have a cup of tea or, or, or a pint with them um, because they're funny and they clearly like and respect each other and uh, that made this journey all the more pleasant. So uh, this is a terrific book and congratulations to, to Robert and Jamie. I think it's going to be a very successful book and it deserves to be. I guess the good place to start would be maybe you can uh, begin by explaining what exactly you mean by the animal brain and why it's useful to think about our brains in this way. Yeah, so you know, I, anyone who's read any pop psychology these days will be very familiar with these. You know, people talk about the monkey brain, the lizard brain, the bird brain. Uh, you know, um, there's all sorts of metaphors going on. And in um, uh, some of you, again, who are familiar with uh, Susan Mickey's and my work on the, com- the COMB model, capability, opportunity, motivation, behavior model, will know that motivation we split up into reflective and automatic motivation. Um, I've never been really fully happy with that, dis- with that terminology, because in a way, you know, everything that goes on in the brain is kind of automatic. But um, so the question is where, you know, what is the sort of dividing line? Um, and having studied psychology, you know, since the 1970s, 
one of the things is, uh, you know, that any academic psychologist will be very familiar with is animal experiments. You know, we do animal experiments. Why do we do animal experiments? You know, if they've got no bearing on what humans might do? Well, the reason is because actually they have some bearing. They don't have, you know, you know there's certain thing, parts of our brain that evolved way before uh, human you know, cortex came on the scene. And those parts of the brain are kind of still there. They're not still there in the, in the same form they were, they've been adapted. Uh, and they're not exactly the same as a rat brain or a lizard brain or a monkey brain or whatever. But they do have certain things in common with other species, which means that if we study other species, we can learn something about ourselves. And so it, it's, it's really focusing on that. And that is you know, those things that we know other species have, you know, whether it's dogs or cats or cows or whatever, we know that they have emotions. We know that they get angry, that they get afraid, that they get excited and so on. We know that they have wants and needs, that um, they, can, they can imagine futures. You know, if you ever see a dog, um, you know, that's when the, uh, someone, the master come, or mistress comes home and the dog is, you know, expecting to go for a walk, it gets excited because it's imagining a future in which it's going to be going for a walk. So they can imagine the future. So they have wants and needs, no question about it. They have habits, they have instincts, and so and so do we. And so the idea here is that we have all of this stuff that we kind of share uh, to some degree with other species, not in exactly the same way. And we have to deal with that, you know, in order to get what the human part of our brain wants, we have to work with that, uh, that part of our brain. That's the theory. Do you ever find it a bit sort of deflating you know the kind of thing you think oh no i'm when we're taught as we will talk a little bit about praise and punishment you think oh aren't we a bit simple <laughs> <laughs> no incredibly complicated i mean you know so complicated that uh, i've been thinking this quite a bit actually uh, and talking with some friends and colleagues about it about the notion of randomness um you know we have in a sense, you know, this is sort of partly where free will comes in, that, you know, when you have a complex system that is, unbel- that is incredibly complicated, and that includes our animal brain as well as our human brain, um, then, uh, you know, you have inherent in unpredictability. It's not, it's not randomness in the sort of true sort of philosophical sense of the word, but it is unpredictability. And that unpredictability arises from the complexity of the brain. And so, yeah, no, our, our animal brains are inordinately complex. Uh, and um, and it, you know, even if they were simple, I think it would still be, uh, you know, it, would, it wouldn't demean us in any way, but, you know, there's no doubt about it. Com- uh, we are complex. When we talk about uh, rewards and punishment or uh, praise and punishment, I guess praise is a kind of reward, um, when we're trying to change behavior in other people or change behavior in ourselves, is it as simple as rewarding the behavior we want and punishing the behavior we don't want? Reward and punishment are incredibly important ways of controlling our animal brain. Now, um, again, psychologists or anyone familiar with psychology will be familiar with the, the, the concept of what they call operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is uh, a process whereby uh, we, le- we and other animals learn to do things by virtue of uh, certain things happening after, they, after we've done them. But um, uh, you know, there's, there's a huge amount of research being done on the timing and the frequency and how you operate these rewards and punishments. And, uh, and in the book, this is what we want to try and distill down. Lesson number one, uh, which, and I'm not saying this as a humanitarian, I'm not saying this because I like people and I want people to be happy. I'm saying this because it's important if you want to influence behavior. Go to reward first, right? You only ever use punishment when you have to, because punishment has all sorts of other knock-on effects um, and in many cases, and if we get to talk around testosterone later, um, <clears throat> you know, it's different for different people. People higher in testosterone have more difficulty learning from punishment, which is really important when you're in the criminal justice system. So um, you've got to, A, start with reward. Secondly, and this is where we get to a, a technical term that I want to get into the, into the English language sort of 
uh, vocabulary, which is the variable ratio schedule of reinforcement or VR schedule of reinforcement. Other psychology books, um, many of them talk about what they call intermittent reinforcement, and they recognize how important intermittent reinforcement is. So what it, what's that? First of all, intermittent reward, say, is not rewarding something every time it happens, but only rewarding it on um, some schedule, like what, at once every two times, once every five times or whatever. That's fine. Within that, you've got the variable ratio schedule of reinforcement. The variable ratio schedule says you reward it unpredictably every now and then. You don't reward it like every fifth time, every 10th time. Now, a variable ratio schedule of reinforcement is an incredibly powerful way of controlling behavior once you've got it established because it makes the behavior very resistant to extinction, as it's called. The behavior will stick around, even if it hasn't been rewarded for ages and ages and ages. And so the variable ratio schedule of reinforcement creates very persistent behavior that is resistant to changes in the environmental situation. And of course, as we all know, that is the basis for the gambling industry. That's how it operates, through a variable ratio, unpredictable schedule of reinforcement. But if I may, uh, I can add one other thing that the gambling industry is also very familiar with, uh, but operates in all our lives all the time. And that is secondary reinforcers. So you, you don't just reward things every now and then unpredictably, you add into the mix what we call secondary reinforcers. These are stimuli that in and of themselves have no particular motivational significance shining a light for example something you know a blue light notifications on our phone exactly you know in and of itself you know so what but if it is associated then with a primary enforcer with reward you know something good happening uh, then it takes on a motivational significance and it what it can do is it can keep a behavior change going much much longer and much more persistently than you could do if you only had the reward at the end of the chain. So if you, and obviously with, you know, uh, fruit machines and so on, they have the lights and they have all sorts of other things. So they got all sorts of um, tricks to get you, get your animal brain, literally your animal brain uh, motivated to keep uh, engaging in this behavior and some people more susceptible than others. But anyway, you put secondary reinforcers, they're already getting a bit technical, but I hope you can see the you know, why this is important with variable ratio schedule of reinforcement. And you've got a really powerful way of controlling the behavior. So, no, thank you so much for um, inviting me to say a few words. Um, and it's really lovely to be here. So, uh, as Robert said uh, earlier, as well as being an associate of the Centre for Behaviour Change, I lead research and development for an organisation called Zinc. Um, and so for the last five years or so, I've been working in early stage innovation, uh, supporting entrepreneurs and startup businesses who are focused on tackling an important societal problem in areas like health, education, climate, et cetera. Um, and part of my role, a big part of my role is to translate scientific research to support entrepreneurs in the development of new products and services. And because this kind of innovation relies on an understanding of human behavior, this is a world that is at least um, in principle, really well placed to embrace good quality psychological science. But it's not at all easy to find resources that are accessible and practical, but that don't misrepresent the complexity of the science. Um, and I think this is the thing that this series of books has managed to do so expertly and thoughtfully. Um, and I thought I might just share a couple of examples of where I think that balance has been struck particularly well um, in React. So first, I thought the way in which the book approaches um, definition discussions um, was incredibly clear and, and helpful. So as you've just heard, this is a book primarily about instincts, habits and feelings. And those are all, of course, words that we use loosely and variably in everyday parlance. 
Um, but Robert makes a compelling case in the book for why definitions matter um, when we're trying to understand human behavior and maybe particularly when we're trying to understand the more unconscious influences on human behavior. So um, helpful distinctions between wants and needs and drives, helpful distinctions between engagement and enjoyment and why, why these matter, um, uh, the, the kind of psychological science definitions matter. Um, and those uh, sort of definition discussions are peppered throughout the book, I think, and approached in a really accessible way. And the second um, thing I wanted to highlight is the way the, this particular book talks about individual variation. So while it offers a lot of specific tips and recommendations, it also um, highlights what you might call uh, the role of kind of self-experimentation. So in the section on how to build habits, for example, Robert shares some specific strategies for habit formation. Um, and then Jamie shares a reflection about this not kind of working really as a one size fits all. Um, he says, I feel like I'm constantly making adjustments to my routine, my environment and habits to get myself to do the things I want on a regular basis. Um, and to me, this kind of inherent complexity and nuance uh, and variation that comes with behavior change is, is super important to convey. And this idea that as individuals, we need to explore and experiment to find what works for us. Um, and this is something I think not all books manage to do very well as kind of give some ingredients that might help without presenting it as a kind of one size fits all recipe. So in this case, acknowledging that building habits will be a dynamic process that we should be kind of monitoring and uh, refining over time. So I would say in general, this is a book that's full of engaging anecdotes, digestible translations of complex science. There's really very few people I know who can communicate complex phenomena in the way that Robert does. Um, and also full of practical examples and useful analogies. I, I think kind of disproportionate number of which are focused on garlic bread, um, which was uh, particularly entertaining. And the dialogue format, as in the earlier book, Energize, works really well um, as a way of keeping readers engaged. So I've no doubt that this will be an incredibly valuable resource to people uh, in the world that I work in, and I'm sure more broadly in other sectors as well. So we use the term want to refer to feelings of attraction to something as a result of anticipated pleasure or satisfaction uh, in psychological terms, sort of positive reinforcing stimuli uh, and needs then, uh, we're using this term as a sort of subjective need, not an actual need, it's a feeling of need, um, as being attracted to something by virtue of avoiding or escaping something of unpleasant or aversive, which could be physical or it could be psychological. It could be anxiety, depression, pain, um, just something you don't want to happen. So, so this distinction between wants and needs is essentially between uh, being attracted to something because your imagination of it is something that you think will be positive, and being attracted to something because you're in your imagination of it, it's something which you think will help you escape or avoid something negative. That's the key distinction. Now they are closely related um, because you can want something so badly that the thought of not getting it becomes a need, right? Uh, as with children and ice cream, for example, where you see a child crying, they're not, they're not crying because they want some ice cream, they're actually crying because their brain is, is really distressed by the idea that they can't have an ice cream or they may not be able to have one so so you can want something so bad uh, uh, that you that you come to need it but also the experience of having a need satisfied can be pleasurable as in uh drinking a, a pint of beer or some cool drink when you're really thirsty so the thirst is creating a need and the satisfying of that need is pleasurable. So they, they, they obviously intertwine with each other, but they do need to be kept apart separate, uh, conceptually. Before we worked on that together, if you'd have asked me, what are our common sources of wants and needs? I think I could have kind of said, okay, we need uh, food, shelter, sex, um, I don't know, friendship, uh, 
community, whatever. I, I'm sort of starting to run a bit dry quite quickly there. Maybe it's my lack of imagination on this, but in the book, there's the list, and it's not exhaustive in the book. It's a lot of stuff that we are wanting and needing, and they can really be in conflict with each other quite often. Just reading through the list, you go, my God, I want this and I need that. Yes, I, I need all these things. For this book, I sat down and I just went through all the papers, articles, reviews, books, everything I could find to identify what humans want and need. And of course, what you have in, in psychology are lots of theories which cover little bits of it. So for example, self-determination theory covers certain needs or sources of needs around competence, around connectedness, um, and so on. Those are important. They're really important. Then you've got you know, theories of uh, uh, drug addiction, for example, which focus on, you know, euphoriant effects, for example, or withdrawal symptoms or pain, you know, anxiety, depression, and so on. Anyone who studies psychology will be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which puts um, at the really most basic needs that we need to satisfy, you know, staying alive, hunger, thirst, and so on, and at the top sort of spiritual stuff. And Maslow was very familiar with this. You know, you need to go beyond the hierarchy of needs. You know, what his theory was was really, really insightful. Um, people interpreted as saying you've got to satisfy your basic needs before you can do your uh, your spiritual needs. That's not true. You know, it's patently not true. Patently, there are people who, for identity, for uh, for um, for all sorts of higher needs, as it were will sacrifice their lives. They will go on hunger strike or whatever. So, so it's not a hierarchy, but there's an awful lot of them. And when you, when you look at that list, you see what the, why it's so important when you're studying motivation and, and working with you know, people uh, to help people to achieve what, what their goals are, to understand what the differences are between people in those wants and needs at a given moment. So yeah, it's a long list. delighted to be here and um, both Robert and Jamie thank you for asking me um so I'm, I'm sort of fortuitously I sit after you've been talking about wants and needs because the the definition of of that was particularly interesting to me as someone as you say Robert who works in behavior change marketing and predominantly with a public health focus so I'm always looking at ways in which we can try and intercept and improve choice making and and healthy uh, behaviors as a result and I found the defining um, into an imagined positive future and needs being a desire to get rid of an unpleasant feeling very, very helpful. But then as, I, as we were touching upon last week, Robert, as I was thinking about how we ask people to quantify their wants and needs, I couldn't help but think of our current climate um, and the cost of living and the, the challenges we're facing right now and how these might affect the way in which one might put these um, into a hierarchy. And as you rightly just talked about there, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs somewhat oversimplified um, and not wholly universal in how people within certain so cultural circumstances or other influences might, might be living their lives. And Combi is obviously, obviously not the main focus of React, but I was also thinking about diminished motivation and opportunity due to environmental factors and the possible implications of this in terms of any decision making. So, again, as I was pondering, when we think about something like smoking, which is something that you and I, Robert, have worked extensively in, you know, might the cost of living crisis likely mean people are more successful in quitting as they simply cannot afford it? Or could it actually mean the opposite for addicts as they might rather smoke than eat sort of question? And how could we in any way um, appropriately leverage a crisis to encourage healthy behaviours? Um, and might the same question be applied to how people, quote unquote, choose to eat, given both cost of food and energy, as well as the need to take care of family members? Um, and then I also thought about the issues of exacerbated mental health and depression and how this could further limit motivation and decision making, perhaps due to a feeling of hopelessness as we move into a difficult win winter. And on a deeper level still, the book touches on a human sense of self, um, having agency, fulfillment and purpose. And again, I wonder how certain conditions can only uh, diminish perceived freedoms and freedoms of choice and how this could actually be further, further damaging. And what could we possibly do to counter some of this to enable some sort of sense of freedom, enabling th people to do things that are both rewarding and enjoyable. And the book sort of goes on to explore that. But how can we continue to do that when life 
what life is so tough um will any intention to build healthier habits be surpassed by simply a need to survive that said um like rachel has alluded to i found that the hell how to help build health habits rather section incredibly helpful um both from a personal and professional um perspective largely because they can be so simple to implement particularly your steer on um, being as specific as possible when defining the habit and the principles of reward versus enjoyment. Um, the final thing that I found um, incredibly interesting as a practitioner was this the notion of non-reward um, because we've done a lot of work in countering myths and disinformation with regard to um, vaccines and vaccine take-up. So your point about um, being consistent with non-reward rather than occasionally giving in and reacting to things rings so true on that front because we should never engage with purveyors of fake news or else you just give more oxygen and platform to to a message which is so wholly unhelpful and we apply a similar principle when we look at how we need to maintain child safety online um, so those were my my musings on all of it so congratulations to both of you thank you and I'm very much looking forward to the science of decision making when that one comes down the line We're now going to uh, move into um, some questions and answers. We have a question here from um, Rachel, and she says, uh, could you explain how you integrate these learnings from individual psychology, i.e. individual understanding and control of the, the brain, into wider scale applications of behaviour change, which doesn't usually focus on the individual level? You can approach... Uh, human behavior from any of these different levels. So, so if, if you're interested in the behavior of, you know, the person standing in front of you, then at the microscopic level, at the atomic level, there's stuff obviously in the book and there's stuff that psychology can tell you uh, about how to address that. As soon as you get two people, three people, four people, then you start to build another kind of structure and another level, level of analysis. And obviously, social psychology and sociology are very much um, around the study of groups, as they're called. Or, but it, but they could be they don't have to be face to face groups. They could be um, just you know uh, a, a number of people, whether or not they interact. And then, of course, you keep going out until you get to whole populations. So um, if you look at um, uh, uh, expanding out from the sort of the atomic the, the uh, level the, the the individual level to these other levels essentially there's two ways there's, there's two things you have to take into consideration one is the uh, the fact that you're dealing with averages you're dealing with and distributions so when i when i'm trying to plan a marketing campaign for a group of people then uh, one of the things i have to worry you know worry about is what in general i'm not going to hit everyone what in general is that, you know, uh, how can I sort of pitch this so that it's going to catch as many people as possible and their wants and needs, their circumstances and so on. So you have to, you have to think statistically. There's another level, which is as soon as you get more than one person uh, together, you start to see structures like influence structures, communication structures. And that's where you, you're dealing with, for example, organizations. So, you know, obviously there's, there's a whole area of work around organizational change and organizational psychology and so on. So uh, this book is very focused on psychology, uh, at the psychological approaches, but at the same time, hopefully it provides a perspective that allows you to, to, to grow across these multiple levels. As, and, and the way you do it is by um, recognizing the ways in which you need to generalize from the principles that are set out in the book. So that, that's the key. And in my own work, in the work that Jamie Brown and Leon uh, Shahab and I have been doing over the years, we've approached this using a system called agent-based modeling. So some of you will be familiar, it's quite technical, but essentially the idea is that you, you've got your individual agents, but they're connected and you get emergent properties that arise out of that connectiveness that aren't always um, predictable from the properties of the, uh, of the individuals themselves. So there are tools and systems models and approaches to, to, to dealing with that in a technical sense. But what we're doing in this book is just giving you the sort of uh, the atomic level, the, the sort of the, the thinking that could be then generalised. That brings us on to a question um, um, from Guinevere, uh, who asks, 
Who is your target audience and what inspired you to write the book? I love reading um, psychology books and books that feel like books that will help you, you know, I guess self-help books, self-improvement books. And I was very keen on this book that we would have quite a broad target audience. Basically, myself, if I didn't know this information, and a lot of it I didn't know before we wrote the book anyway. And we focused quite carefully, and Alia, who edited the book, made sure that we were always thinking about how this could in how this information could help the individual reader at that in their lives. So a lot of times we think everyone's going to be really interested in persuading other people. And I know many people watch and feel that way, but people are really interested in changing their own lives. And of course, the tools are very similar. So I wanted it to be useful for people who are working, uh, you know, in organizations and companies, but also just general people who want to build habits better, who want to work in more productive and effective ways. That was at least part of my thinking. The sort of ethical part of me and, and, and you know, my, the emotional part of me, I would say, uh, wants a book like this to be able to empower people um, because we are all subject to nefarious Syria, I mean, on today of all days, you know, we you know we know this to be true. We are subject to really nefarious influences, and by people who either know the sort of stuff that's in this book, or have sort of figured it out instinctively, or they've got the power to be able to implement it, and it's destroying our society. You know, the, the lying, cheating, weaseling. You know, uh, you know the kind of things that is going on in society, and obviously it always has to a certain degree, but it feels like it's worse now, is, is now endemic. And uh, one of the things that I really, really want people to do is to be resilient to this and to see what's going on. So it's some part of me really would like this book to basically tell people what other people are trying to do to them so that they can be. Um, empowered to resist it. Um, but also, you know, for those for those people who are trying to do things that I approve of, you know, try, like trying to make the world a better place, uh, and I see this in, in politics very much, um, is that our natural animal brain, when someone does something really bad, you know, we want to react. We want to, you know, some part of our animal brain is going, yeah, you know, and I will respond in a particular way. If instead we think, okay, that's, uh, you know, it might make me feel better for a little bit, very short period of time. Um, but actually, what do I want out of this situation? Then it can lead us to think a little, you know, it can hopefully people can use, you know, what's in this book to say, okay, well, actually, rather than do it like that, I want to achieve this objective in this situation with this group of people. How can I do that more effectively? So, so that is actually part of my motivation. We talk about in the book about when do you try and influence people? And it's usually not when the emotions are running hot. You know, you're, that's pretty much the, the, the worst time. Yeah, actually, there's a, very, <laughs> there's a very good cartoon. I can't remember if it was in Private Eye or Punch, but it's, uh, it's, there's a motorist uh, driving along with, with uh, his partner and, um, and he sees a sign on the side of the road that says, stop and think. And he says, it really makes you stop and think. <laughs> and actually, you know, that simple piece of advice is tremendously important, you know, for us, which is, uh, you know, there'll be, when you're in the throes of emotion, in the throes of desire, in the throes of an impulse to do something, if you can sort of stand back a little bit and give your, your human brain uh, an opportunity, a better opportunity to harness, you know, the animal brain. So hold your horses here. Let's, we're not going this way. We're going this way. Then you can be so much more effective. How does social media work in this space? The job of social media is to get us to do stuff, whether we like it or not. That's the key. So, and things can be reinforcing. This is so important to understand. Things can be reinforcing for us, even if we don't actually enjoy them. That is so important to understand that. And we can find ourselves doing things and we don't know why we're doing it.
but we are because it's tapping into that part of our animal brain. I was thinking more about the actions of individuals with large followings rather than the companies ah. themselves. They're quite interesting. Okay. Well, as someone with a very small following, <laughs> <laughs> I, um, it, it, it's, that is a very interesting question because you, what you, what I even, and you said this yourself, Jamie, that what you find yourself doing is craving more following. You know, very instinctively, you're looking for more followers. You're looking for more clicks, more hits, and so on. Uh, and unless you're very, you're conscious of the fact that this is a, this is a, a you know. This is a siren's call that will, you know, could lead you to disaster, um, or in any case, isn't particularly productive. <clears throat> then, um, you know, you've got potentially a problem. But you're, but I, it, Ali, if you're if you're talking about the, you know, what this means is that it actually shapes the actions of influencers, that then shape the actions of the people who follow them. Um, you've got potentially a, a rather destructive cycle there. And again, it'd be really nice if a book like this. Could, could help to start a conversation about how you break that cycle. And we do have some um, tips and things in the, in the book uh, to about putting boundaries on usage and things like that. Okay, uh, we've got some other terrific questions. Oh, here's one. This should be easy. I'd be this is a question from James. I'd be interested to hear views on how harnessing works. I don't believe that we have conscious free will. We've got to free will. <laughs> These conversations always right. end up at free will. I believe in the complex biological machine theory. We turn inputs into outputs based on environmental, biological, subconscious factors. Randomness and luck play a large part. Are we actually harnessable? We, we are physical entities in a physical universe that's subject to the laws of cause and effect. Those laws of cause and effect, uh, notwithstanding quantum theory and so on, um, have uh, a huge amount of regularity in them uh, and there's a huge amount we don't understand but even if we did understand it, it like for example rolling a die a single die you can't predict i mean in theory you can but in practice you can't predict where it's going to end up it could in one in 20 squillion times end up on its edge it will uh, you know if you do it enough times it will do that but by and large it's going to end up on one of its six sides but you try predicting that, even if you're Einstein or the best physicist in the world. But it's subject to the laws of cause and effect. There's nothing mysterious going on there. What it is, is, is that you've got a multitude of tiny, tiny little forces which end up um, having big effects on the dice. One, six, three, whatever. And so humans and biological systems, I think, are like that. So <clears throat> when, when I talk about harnessing the animal brain. I'm talking about one part of our brain, our complex system, which is subject to ran these, that sort of randomness, harnessing another part. It's, there's no person sitting at the steering wheel in our brains. There is our brain. And so it is actually one, it's, it's the influence of one system over another. You have to treat, you have to treat people, all of us, as though we have agency, because we do in, a, in, the, in every way that's important to us, we have agency. But at the same time, if you're trying to influence behavior, you have to do the very best you can to understand the laws of cause and effect that are operating on that behavior, because otherwise you'll make terrible mistakes and you won't satisfy your needs and you won't satisfy their needs either. I'm assuming that you don't think there is an actual split between the human and animal brain that it is a mechanism for understanding the ancient part of our brain, or do you think they are distinct? Put a pin in that one. Um, question two, it's looking like there isn't really a body-mind split. If this is indeed true, what role does our biology, age, gender, diet, sleep, etc., play in our capability to make changes to our behavior? The animal brain, the human brain is a metaphor it's a way of thinking about um, the different functions that the brain performs, number one. Number two is, of course, the animal brain is always influencing our human brain. I mean, not least very obviously in the way that our emotions and our desires influence our beliefs. 
the the animal brain and the human brain are constantly speaking to each other. The horse is uh, the horse is uh, influencing the rider, and the rider is influencing the horse. Basic biological processes have very powerful effects. You know, I mentioned testosterone earlier. You know, when and testosterone levels in, in any individual go up and down in response to environmental stimuli. Uh, and testosterone has a massive effect on the, or a big effect anyway, on the extent to which we uh, learn from punishment. So uh, yeah, th these things, general and specific, are influencing us all the time. Do you think personality has a role in our ability to change behaviour? What is it that differentiates one person from another? Well, there, there are many ways in which we, we're different, and personality we talk about personality um, uh, in terms of rather general dispositions to feel things and behave in different way. One of the sort of personality theories that has, has really, I think, dominated the last 20, 30, 40 years is the five factor theory of personality. And the reason it's dominated it is because it just keeps getting verified. Um, in in any different any culture you you like to mention, so the idea of the um, the five factor theory is you've got extroversion introversion as a dimension, you've got what, uh, what neuroticism uh, versus stability, let's call it trait anxiety versus you know low levels of anxiety, you've got uh, what they call agreeableness being nice or not being nice, uh, that's three. You've got conscientiousness high and low, and you've got openness. Uh, which is kind of you know, being open to new experiences and so on versus not. You take those five dimensions and you just they keep coming up in in people's behavior and so on. But of course, that's only one. You know, those are five sort of really basic dimensions that you see across society. But then, you know, as with the Myers Briggs, as with lots of other measures of individual differences, like you know, intelligence tests and so on, and aptitude tests of one sort or another, you, you can cut this cake any number of ways into any number of different slices. Um, and it's really important to do that. You do need to understand what it is that differentiates one person from another. In that respect, a lot of those differences will have been sort of hardwired in your genes. For example, trait anxiety has quite a high heritability. So the difference between one person and another in terms of how anxious they are or tend to be, um, you know, has a strong heritable component to it. That's not to say that it's, you know, heritability, strong high heritability, by the way, doesn't mean fixed. It just means that the difference between one person and another is uh, in this, in a bit given situation, is largely uh, or high, to a large extent due to uh, genetic differences. We are a product of our genes and our environment interacting over time uh, to produce what we are at any, any given time. Some of that's quite stable, as in personality. Some of it is actually very unstable, as in sort of, you know, certain states that we might be in at a given time. We have um, a question from Ali here, which is, as you wrote the book, did you find yourself consciously or unconsciously changing your own habits? I've always believed, as Jamie and my other children will testify, in applying your, the, the, whatever understanding you've been able to glean uh, in psychology to your family life. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, yes, I do. Uh, why, why wouldn't I? I mean, it's, it's like if you're an app developer, uh, app developers have this term, I think, dog fooding, don't they? Which is, you know, if you, if, you don't, if you try and use the app and you don't like it, well, who else is going to? So, so yes, I think it's, if, if you write a book on psychology, and you don't put into practice the things that it says, what's, <laughs> that's not a great vote of confidence for what you're writing. I found very much that there were some big changes actually to how I was thinking about, uh, you know, since working on this book and discussing the principles, which we've done for a number of years, and it was around when do you praise and when do you punish? And, and, and also praising yourself, which I suppose is quite sort of, we talk about it a bit more now, it's actually quite powerful, even though it may seem a little bit sort of silly to do. But as a writer, I have to generate a lot of a motivation, self, I have to motivate myself. And so after learning these principles, I sometimes I'd find myself inadvertently punishing myself after I'd written. So imagine I'd procrastinated a bit 
And then I finally got to write, I don't know, six or seven o'clock at night. And I did I don't know, an hour or something like that. And then I'd finish and I'd go, well, that's the least I could have done, you know? So I'd done the behavior that I wanted, the fact that I had written, albeit a bit later, and I'd sort of punished myself. And now I make a very clear, I make a, a point to, I send myself an email after every writing session that I do, praising myself, saying, I, and I say, this is fantastic. And I make sure also that I don't immediately look at the news after I've just finished a writing session, because that's quite aversive, I <laughs> I find, and quite punishing in and of itself. You think, oh, I just finished a bit of writing and I'll browse the internet or something. Then you read a horrific piece of news, like someone's just become prime minister who you don't like. <laughs> um, so yeah, I that was a big, it sounds, maybe it sounds like nothing, but it's, it was quite a big change. Well, Jamie, it's now 5.30 and uh, thank you very much for taking part. And most of all, thank you all uh, for those of you who, who, who come to this uh, launch event. It's, it's so nice to see, you know, really nice to see sort of um, <clears throat> names and, uh, of people who I haven't seen for ages. And I hope we can, we can actually catch up after this. Um, and those of you who I don't know, but who, you know, who've come, uh, then uh, uh, thank you very much for coming. Really appreciate it. Anyway, thanks everyone, and um, um, many of you, I think, I will be seeing uh, you know, before too long. Uh, but um, anyway, that's it for now. Thanks a lot. <laughs>